The menu film opens with Margot, Anya Taylor-Joy, and Tyler, Nicholas Holt, waiting on a dock for a boat to take them to an island. Margot smokes a cigarette and Tyler tells her not to because it will ruin her palate. She notes the boat's small and he says they only have 12 guests, they make a profit by charging $1,250 a head. We meet some of the other guests, Lillian Bloom, Janet McTeer, is a food critic who raved about Hawthorne, the restaurant they're headed to when it first opened, she is accompanied by her husband, Ted, Paul Adelstein. Tyler tells Margot that restaurants rise and fall based on her reviews. There are also three tech brothers who are rowdy, all bragging about their expertise on hedge funds and cryptocurrency. They board the boat and the captain greets them, telling them it's a 30-minute boat ride to Hawthorne. A movie star, John Leguizamo, boards the boat, complaining that his assistant, Felicity, Amy Carrero, has booked something so elaborate for dinner. Everyone is given a small bite to start the journey, along with champagne. It's described in a hoity-toity way, e.g., silver-bright salmon caviar harvested this morning right here in the Sound. Served with a smoked Hood River oyster, oyster leaf cream, and a pale ale air. Tyler is quick to take a picture before Margot and him eat. He describes it in a hoity-toity way, you need the richness of the cream and the mouthfeel of the roe. Margot is unenthused. The boat arrives on the island, and everyone deboards and is greeted by servers and house staff on the deck. Each checks in but Elsa, Hong Chao, the restaurant captain, eyes Margot suspiciously. She tells Tyler that she's not who he had originally signed up to attend with, and he said that he has broken up with his girlfriend and is bringing Margot instead. This unnerves Elsa. All of the twelve guests are lounging at an expanse behind the restaurant. Two of them, and Judith Light, and her husband Richard, Reed Burney, are regulars, so they just head straight to the restaurant and avoid the introduction. Elsa welcomes the others and tells them they're going to be a part of a unique story told with the menu, one that hasn't been told before and will never be told again. They get a tour of the island, being told it is 12 acres of forest and also has access to the sea so the manly clams they'll be eating tonight were harvested that day by a man in a rowboat. They're shown the smokehouse where they're told the dairy cow meat is aged for 152 days. One of the Tech brothers jokes, what happens if you serve it on the 153rd day? Does all hell break loose? Elsa replies, at this temperature, on the 153rd day, the bacteria, having breached the interior of the flesh, would seep into the customer's bloodstream and produce a series of very unpleasant symptoms. Pathogens would spread into the customer's spinal cord membrane, at which point he or she would become incapacitated and shortly thereafter expire. So, yes. All hell breaks loose. They are then shown the root cellar. Elsa mentions she knows of the guest's allergies, nut, shellfish, gluten sensitivity, and the menu has been planned accordingly. They're then shown the bunkhouse where all of the staff lives, in bunk beds like on a military barrack. Elsa explains that the staff is like a family working on a common mission to run the world's finest restaurant. They work 80 hours a week, starting at 6 a.m. for 5 hours of prep work, harvesting, gathering, fermenting, slaughtering, butchering, chopping, marinating, steeping, smoking, tempering, liquefying, spherifying, etc. Then they have 4 hours for pre-service prep. Supper is 4 and a half hours long. Then the kitchen has to be scrubbed for 2 hours. She is asked if she ever gets burned out, but she says Chef holds himself to the highest possible standard and we have the honor of working at Hawthorne. As they continue across the lawn to the restaurant, Tyler asks about a cottage on a hill. Elsa says it's where the chef lives, but even the staff isn't allowed inside. The door to the restaurant is opened, a large square in the wall that opens outwardly, and they all enter. There is a sad old woman drinking at a table in the back, and and Richard are already seated. There is an open kitchen behind all the tables where the staff is hard at work. Elsa tells them all not to photograph the dishes because Chef feels strongly that part of the beauty of his creations is precisely their ephemeral nature. Tyler wants to see the kitchen and he takes Margot to talk to the sous chef who is making little gels. 
Tyler asks if he made it with a PacoJet and brags about all his foodie knowledge. The sous chef knows Tyler by name and says everyone on staff knows all about those who dine with them. He takes his seat and Margot points out that, while the sous chef knows his name, Tyler never asked for his. Everyone is given a little wine to start out. Chef Slowick, Ralph Fiennes, appears in the kitchen. He's brooding and intense. He tastes the dish they're about to serve and approves. All the servers then begin to serve the amuse-bouche, which were told in a title card, as if on a menu, e.g., a pine nut toile cone filled with a shucks and strawberry sofrito and a goat's milk snow. Tyler takes a photo and Margot points out he's not supposed to. They both try the food and Tyler ravishes it, but Margot isn't as impressed by the experience. Tyler begins crying, touched at the dish being beautiful. Margot is dismissive and doesn't want to eat any of it. She is immediately skeptical of the entire restaurant. The rest of the room revels in it. The food critic Lillian Bloom analyzes the dish, I've never tasted anything so thalassic, thalassa being the primeval spirit of the sea in Greek mythology. Her husband agrees that they're eating the ocean. The movie star needs guidance from his assistant on how to approach the meal. The three tech brothers just loudly talk about tech and then criticize the plate, the plating's a little frou-frou. I've had shellfish just as good at Kashiba. But whatever, now we can say we've been here. We're buying an experience. Elsa watches it all with contempt. Chef stares at Margot. Tyler notices and wonders if Chef is staring at him. Margot turns and sees, making eye contact with him. The chef shouts that they're plating in five and the entire kitchen shouts back yes, chef, in unison. Next, everyone is given bread service. The chef gives a speech about how bread has existed for 12,000 years and is usually common among the poor. It's just flour and water and even today, grain represents 65% of all agriculture while fruits and vegetables are only 6%. He then talks about how the group there is not the common man so tonight they get no bread. Instead everyone is given shale plates with just the condiments. A title reads, breadless bread plate, no bread, savory accompaniments. Everyone is offended by this. It comes with a note explaining that the bread they are not allowed to consume that night is made from a heritage wheat called Red Fife, crafted with a company devoted to preserving heirloom grains. The movie star tries the creams. Lillian Bloom laughs it off as the chef being keenly aware of food as a history of class while still preserving his sense of the delicious. She complains that the emulsion on one of the sauces is broken, while her husband concurs. Lillian points out that the chef weaves allegories into his food and the game is trying to get what the overarching theme of the entire meal is going to be, you can't really tell until the last course. Tyler snaps another photo of the food. Margot doesn't understand why he's so into it. He explains how much he adores food and that it's an art that he appreciates. Back at Lillian's table, she goes on and on about how she makes her own bread and even her own yeast. They are interrupted when Elsa brings a larger container of the broken emulsion that Lillian complained about, courtesy of Chef Slowick. Elsa is called over by the Tech Brothers. They complain that they understand all the conceptual stuff, but they would like some bread because Hawthorne is super famous for it. Elsa tells them, no. One of the Tech brothers is offended and says you know who we are, right? Elsa says, yes. He reminds her, we work with Doug Verick. She replies, no, you work for Mr. Verick. The Tech brothers insist she brings them bread, but she says no and they say wow, offended. Elsa leans in and whispers to one, you will eat less than you desire and more than you deserve. Margo notices Richard who is familiar to her. And points out to Richard that Margo looks like their daughter. The chef comes over and asks Margo why she isn't eating. She says I guess I don't want to fill up early. The chef says that would not be possible. Fori precisely designed the portions to account for that. Please eat. The menu makes sense only if you eat. Margot points out he told them not to eat when he said to, instead, taste. He tells her that's not what he meant and she knows it. 
Margot tells him, thank you but I'll eat what I want to eat, when I want to eat. Given everyone treats the chef with deference, this is shocking but the chef half smiles and walks away. We see the old woman again, having no food at her table, she simply has a glass of wine. The chef claps and they are told they are going to have the next course, called memory. He tells the group a memory about growing up and points to the old woman, telling them it is his mother. She used to be quite drunk when he came home from school and at seven years old, he arrived and his father was even more drunk. His parents fought and his father wrapped a telephone cord around his mom's neck. To get him to stop, the chef as a child stabbed him in the thigh with kitchen scissors. He never spoke to him again and always wishes he had stabbed him in the throat that evening. The group is then given the first course's memory, chicken thighs al pastor, smoked pineapple salsa, tortillas. They're all given a small chicken thighs with tiny scissors sticking out of them, along with plates fashioned with tightly coiled telephone cords and bowls of tortillas. The tortillas all have images on them. Lillian notices hers have restaurants that were all closed after she gave bad reviews. The Tech Brothers seize document that exposed them for committing fraud. They call Elsa over and ask what they are. She responds, these are tortillas. Tortillas deliciosas. The tech demands she explain the images and she tells them, these are tortillas which contain tax records and other documents showing how the company has hidden transactions with shell companies, performed various acts of intellectual theft, and created seemingly countless invoices with fake charges. She's asked how they got him and Elsa says I'm sorry but chef never reveals his recipes. The tech bro threatens to shut the restaurant down by morning and Elsa tells him that won't be necessary. Inside the ladies room, Margot smokes a cigarette on top of a toilet while looking out a slab. A pair of angel wings are being prepared on the lawn. The chef enters the bathroom and asks Margot what she's doing there. She says it's the ladies room. He responds, I mean here on this island, you little fool. You're not supposed to be here. Margot was a last minute replacement and he wants to know if she's one of them or one of us. He leaves, confusing Margot. When she returns to her table, Margot tells Tyler she wants to leave. He points out they can't because they're on an island and the boat is gone. The Tech brothers complain about the tacos being made up of documents that would hold up in court. They discuss having plausible deniability and if they get turned in, they're turning in Verrick, too, and he won't let that happen. For the fourth course, two servers unroll a tarp across the middle of the floor. It's decorated with baskets and covered with sea fennel and edible flowers. Lillian Bloom and her husband marvel that it's like theater, in the Japanese mini Marsudo style. The chef goes to explain the next course and a tech bro demands to know what is going on. Chef gestures to Elsa and she punches the tech bro in the nose. The guests are shocked. This is the first actual violence they've encountered. The chef continues, introducing the staff to his sous chef, Jeremy, who created the next dish, the mess. Jeremy stands at attention beside him while the chef explains that Jeremy graduated from a culinary institute and wrote a heartfelt letter that he wanted to work at Hawthorne. That Jeremy is talented and very good but he's not great and never will be. He desperate wants my job, my position, my prestige, my status, my talent. Isn't that right, Jeremy? Jeremy responds, yes, chef. Chef tells the group, Jeremy has forsaken everything to try to achieve that. He works 20 hours a day. He has no time for friends or family. His entire life is service and pressure to put out the best food in the world. Pressure to please his chef. Pressure to please the customers. Pressure to please the critics. And even when all goes right, and the food is perfect, and the customers are happy, and the critics are too, there is no way to avoid the mess. The mess you make of your life, of your body, of your health, of your sanity, by giving everything you have to pleasing people you will never know, people whom you increasingly care nothing about. Jeremy, do you like your life, this life you dreamed about? Jeremy responds, no, chef. Chef asks, do you like my life, the life you envy? Crying, Jeremy says, no, chef. 
Chef tells the group, ladies and gentlemen, your fourth course. Sous chef Jeremy's mess. Chef takes a step back. Jeremy removes a pistol from his waistband and blows his brains out. A superimposed title reads the mess, pressure cooked beef, bone broth, heirloom carrots, and potatoes. R.I.P. Jeremy Laux, 1988-2020. Everyone begins screaming and panicking. Richard gets up to leave and Elsa asks if anything is wrong. Richard tells her he's leaving. Elsa says, there is no boat to leave on. Richard tells her, then I'll call a helicopter. Elsa says, that will be difficult without phone service. Richard tries to push past two servers holding meat cleavers and tells him to do what they say and Richard tells her, I'll handle this. Elsa asks, with which hand will you handle it? Your left or your right? Richard doesn't answer so she says she will choose and orders the servers to cut off Richard's left ring finger. They do and Elsa tells the room if anyone tries to leave, they will lose an appendage. The movie star is angry at his assistant for bringing him there. Lillian Bloom is convinced this is a stunt for her benefit, which is why he texted her and invited her personally. Her husband agrees it's performance art, both trying to convince themselves it's not really happening. Margot's timer goes off. She's brought back into Chef's office and asked if she made her decision. She reveals that she is an escort and since Tyler needed a date, he hired her to accompany him. She also notes that she knows Richard given he once hired her to dress up as his daughter while he jerked off and had her say things as if she was her. The chef thinks she should be with the staff as they're the people who have been subjugated, forgotten, starved. The men return to the restaurant and one of the tech boys is given a cake, his colleagues having said it was his birthday when they arrived. He blows out the candle. The chef now points out I'm afraid the menu tonight can't continue as planned until we deal with an unresolved matter. He addresses Tyler who has been sending him letters for months, expressing how much he is a foodie and interested in Hawthorne. Tyler explains he's trying to eat in as many of the world's best restaurants as he can. The chef explains why Tyler hasn't been shocked by that night's events as he's been told in advance that everyone was going to die. He then points out Tyler mentioned that he's a great cook at home and invites him to make the next meal. Tyler is brought into the kitchen to make his own dish, once again on the timer. He sloppily chops up leeks and shallots, which the chef sarcastically mocks, we must learn from Tyler, a new dicing method of which we have been woefully ignorant. Tyler asks for butter to saute them and the chef mocks, leeks and shallots sauteed in butter. I bear witness to a revolution in cuisine. Tyler requests lamb and then adds carrots, capers, and other ingredients into the dish. The chef mocks him, asking if he'd like to put it into the Paco jet, which he bragged about being familiar with earlier. Tyler plates the dish. The chef tries it and playfully pretends to like it before pointing out how atrocious it is. Tyler feels ashamed. He is led to the back, in chef's office, to be dealt with. The chef tells them they have one savory course left on the menu and must prepare for dessert. But Elsa has been negligent and forgot to assign someone to bring a barrel in that's supposed to be in the corner. He tells Margot she will go to the smokehouse to fetch the barrel. Elsa suggests a member of staff should go but chef insists Margot go, to show them once and for all which side she falls on and whether or not she wants to die with them or us. Margot is given the key to the smokehouse. On her way out, she sees Tyler, hanging by a noose, dead in the chef's office. Margot goes out in the lawn and makes her way into the smokehouse. She quickly finds the barrel but first grabs a scaling knife off the wall. Through the window, she sees the chef's cottage. In the restaurant, the movie star asks why he was chosen given all the guests are being punished. The chef says he saw his movie on his one day off, the one on the tortillas, and didn't enjoy it. His assistant asks why she is being punished. He asked where she went to college. She says, Brown. He asks if she has student loans. She says, No. Case closed.
11 people are invited to attend an exclusive dining experience at a restaurant on an island, 30 minutes from land, where the chef and staff devote their lives to providing the meals. At first, the chef puts out pretentious culinary dishes, but as the night continues, people are assaulted for speaking out. The chef has decided that everyone in attendance, including him and the staff, will die at the end of the meal. One woman is a last-minute replacement, an escort hired by a man who has broken up with his girlfriend and the chef considers her an exception to the other guests. When she complains about the food and asks for a simple cheeseburger, she is considered different from the culture that has made the chef hate his passion for culinary arts. She is the only allowed to leave before the restaurant is set on fire as part of the final dessert course of Esmores. Thanks for watching my video. Please like comment support and subscribe my YouTube channel.